Urban Student, Editor-in-Chief, Publisher, Global Brief Magazine, Russia and the West. How did we get here? Uh, what's to be done? On the what's to be done side, uh, as you'll know, 21CQ and Global Brief have been leaders, I would even say globally, in proposing algorithms for the exit or a possible exit from the Russia-West conflict. But let me put to you that the genesis of the conflict starts with basic misunderstandings uh, between the West and Russia about years of importance, mentality, history, narratives. Uh, it may be difficult for some to believe, but we are in fact talking about different things. We in the West, working for sp from a specific mentality, specific history, specific language, and the Russians uh, and those in the Soviet space from their own uh, particular histories, mentality, and, and, and languages. And unfortunately, for the entire world, there was not in enough intersection in the narratives and the understanding uh, to save us from the current crisis. And I hope we'll get there before uh, calamity uh, may strike in the context of, of some of the events to come over the next year or two. We're talking about different years. Let me prove it to you. 1881, 1941, 1994, 2007, and 2012. These are five important years and I think proving to everyone that we in the West and the Russians <coughs> separately in the East are talking about entirely different things and continue to do so. 1881. What happened in Russian history in 1881? Well, most famously, even though many young Russians today would, wouldn't know this, uh, Alexander II, the great liberation czar, was assassinated. There followed uh, a series of massive pogroms, particularly targeting the Jewish population of the Russian Empire. This eventuated in an Odessa Jew from the port city of Odessa in today's Ukraine writing uh, an important document which was called Autoemancipation. It was a declaration that the Jews of the Russian Empire needed to unite and find a state in which they could be politically sovereign in order to save themselves, even though he was an assimilated Jew. He wanted to assimilate into Russian society, as did many Jews at that period. But he said, well, these pogroms keep coming. Autoemancipation. He wrote it anonymously as an Odessa doctor uh, to a Western audience. It never made it out of that space by and large. In 1896, much later, 15 years later, Theodore Herzl's brief won the day and set, the, pro, set the, 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 the general ideology for the modern state of Israel. That was, Herzl was writing from the West, from Vienna, from Paris, Paris uh, after the, um, the Dreyfus affair, and he was writing as an assimilated Western Jew. His brief won the day, Pinsker lost the day. Two completely different mentalities, different languages, different audiences for the most part, uh, one is forgotten in, the, in, in, in history, the other one won the day. 1941. Uh, here I want to talk about the Holocaust only quickly in passing, not as a central event in the conflict at all, but just to prove the point that we are talking about altogether different things. In the West, and particularly my, my, my colleagues of, of my age and younger people, we envision the Holocaust as, as being manifested primarily by Auschwitz and and the like, gas chambers where massive numbers of Jews were, were, were massacred uh, throughout Europe. However, the Holocaust, certainly from the Russian and Soviet perspective, the Ukrainian perspective, uh, starts in 1941, well before Auschwitz is even divined. In fact, Auschwitz is a response to what happened in the Soviet space, where about a million and a half Jews were already massacred in pits across the west of the Soviet Union, well before Auschwitz and the gas chambers were uh, created. How did this happen? The Germans and the Russian and the Soviets uh, created a pact called the Molotov-Ribbentrop. Hitler, in the event, betrayed Stalin, attacked the western flank of the Soviet Union in June of 1941, and there followed four Einsatzgruppen. You can read the interviews of Global Brief with Ben Ferenc, who was one of the Nuremberg prosecutors, about uh, the, the crimes of these Einsatzgruppen as they marauded through the western Soviet space. Uh, one of the most famous of which was the Babi Yar massacre in, in the end of September 1941. But the basic point is that these massive algorithmic killings of Jews, civilians, babushkas, dedushkas, 
sick people, children, because the men were all at the front after all. Uh, these massacres were algorithmic, they were massive, but in the Western space they're largely uh, un either unacknowledged or unknown. And therefore this bespeaks a, a general misunderstanding between the Russia and the West and our reference points. 1994. Where are we in Canada and the Western space in 1994? The Cold War is over. We're talking about different things. If I ask young people in the West what was the major event in 1994 globally, they might say the Yugoslavian Wars, uh, but they'll probably say Rwanda. 800,000 uh, people massacred in the space of a, a, a week or two. And we in the, in, the, in the developed world did nothing, knew nothing about this country. Uh, we developed a doctrine thereafter called the responsibility to protect. For our purpose, what's interesting about 1994 is what were the Russians, the Ukrainians, the post-Soviets thinking about? Well, in the Russian space in particular, the main event is not Rwanda. Rwanda doesn't make the top 20. The main event is Chechnya. It is a, a massive civil conflict within the new Russian state, an altogether new state, uh, that is fighting for its survival. I don't want to go into the specifics, the terrible specifics of, of the, the two Chechen wars, but they were an internal conflict where Russia was thinking mainly about its survival and legitimation as a new post-Soviet space state, much like Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and all the 15 post-Soviet republics. 2007. Uh, Vladimir Putin, the president of, of Russia, gives a, a major speech, now notorious, at the Munich Security Conference. In that speech, he says something to the effect that the crumbling of the Soviet Union, the disintegration of the Soviet Union was the uh, greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, in the West, we lose our mind. Uh, we think that, so, that Putin has become uh, a nostalgic for the Soviet Union, that he is uh, imperially trying to recreate the Soviet Union. Uh, that remains our interpretation in the West. But I would put it to you that from the Russian perspective, what he said was probably not a provocation, but almost a banality. It was almost understood in, in, in the either, as it were, that the collapse of the Soviet Union, whether one liked the state or not as a citizen then, uh, was obviously a catastrophe. How was it so? A massive state broke up yeah. and people need to, needed to deal with the consequences. Some came out winners, some came out losers, but the basic point is that when a massive state erupts or disintegrates, uh, it would take about 30 or 40 years to clean up the mess and to re-establish institutions in, in the flotsam and jetsam left thereafter. And many of the conflicts today are a result of having to reconstitute smaller legitimacies across that former Soviet state. Uh, we will have to re return to that reconstitution in the, in the next lecture, but I want, just want to say that uh, whereas we saw it as provocation, the Russians probably saw it as banality. If you don't believe me, let me put it to you that Putin said the same thing uh, one or two years earlier to, to a, a Russian audience, to the, to the, to the, to the combined parliament in, in Russia, in the Russian language. And because we in the West were not intimately familiar with the post-Soviet space, uh, did not even cover it. So he was almost in a cut and paste way reiterating what he had said before. This is no defense of Putin. I'm not a big fan. It is just a defense of, of the idea that we are talking about different things, some of which in some cases are complete banalities on one side and can seem extreme on the other. Yeah. Unless we're intimately familiar with the context, the language and the mentality, we'll miss the boat entirely. Which brings me to 2012. In 2012 there was a beautiful event happening uh, in the city of Kiev. Yeah. This was two years before the Ukrainian revolution. Uh, what was that event? Uh, it was the Euro Championship of football. Things were calm. Uh, there was no eruption on the horizon. Indeed, in 2012, Barack Obama on a different continent was debating Mitt Romney and both were posed a question by the moderator, I believe in the second debate on foreign policy. And the question was, which state constitutes the biggest threat or what constitutes the biggest threat to the United States? And Mitt Romney answered Russia. Yeah. Now, was he a geopolitical virtuoso? Did he have a, a crystal ball whereby he knew what was going to happen in the next two years? I doubt it. He was improvising. 
For all his intelligence, he's not a virtuoso of foreign affairs. Indeed, Barack Obama, slightly better in foreign affairs probably because he was president, knew he was extemporizing, he was improvising. He was talking through his hat because he said the 1970s, 1980s want their foreign policy back. Russia wasn't on the radar. That's because in 2012 the Euro Championship was happening, things were calm. The post-Soviet space, at least on the surface, was reasonably happy. We were again talking entirely different languages. Now in the next lecture I'll explain how these languages collided in the present conflict and how we can put things back together, put Humpty back, Dumpty back together again, geopolitically, strategically, constitutionally, as it were, uh, between us and the West and the former Soviet space to avoid great calamity.